All right, we are now live, and this is my favorite part because you see all of the participants coming on. You'll see the number just going crazy with everyone coming out of the waiting room there. Um, and you'll start seeing all of the people that are coming on. Um, hi, Audrey, I hope you're doing well. Um, so everyone that's coming on the screen as we're waiting to get a few more people live on the webinar, um, obviously, um, if this is your first time tuning in to a webinar, up at the top right, you can change your view to a gallery view or a speaker view. Um, and if you change it to gallery, you'll see all of our pictures at once and not just the person that, that's speaking. So that might be a little more comfortable for you. Um, and your chat function um, off to the right hand side there. Um, let us know who you are, tell us hello. We love to communicate back and forth with everyone. Hi, Lori. International Spy Museum, thanks for coming back for another webinar with us. Um, and then down at the bottom of your screen um, is the Q&A tab. And if you could submit any questions through Q&A, that's gonna help us keep track of all of the questions coming in, um, but also allow us that if we, for some reason, don't get to the questions, um, allow us to be able to pull them, answer them, and get them back out to you in a timely manner. Um, so Myrtle Beach is in the house, Hudson Valley, Birmingham. Hi, Cheryl. Good to see you again on the call. Reno Tahoe. Jamie, how you doing out there? So lots of Broadway inbound. Jared was on our call before as well. I'm glad that we have Zoom. I was on a call yesterday and the comment was, you know, it's we haven't had that personal interaction, but at least this allows us to, to stay in contact with everyone. So that's uh, really awesome to see all of the people tuning in. As, as always with, uh, with panelists, they, they ask how many people are gonna be on the call. And, and it's always fun to say, you're never gonna believe all of the clients that you, you see, that you work with and see at trade shows that'll be popping up and it's really nice to connect. Still have some people coming in here from all over, Illinois, Iowa, love it. Julie, how are you? Austin's in the house. I love seeing our West Coast people too, even with the time change. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in. Teresa and the historic Route 66, I love that. They have such great itineraries um, all along that, that stretch of road. All right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and get started because people are gonna continue to, to roll in here. Um, so I'd like to take uh, one, thank everybody for being on the webinar. It means a lot to us that, um, that you keep tuning in um, to have these virtual roundtable sessions and um, certainly, we want to just make sure that we're keeping everyone engaged um, and keeping the conversation moving forward as we figure out the best way to, to come out of this in a recovery program. Um, we're focusing on domestic again today, um, and I'm thrilled that we have two uh, amazing companies and amazing people um, that have agreed to be on the panel and, and talk a little bit more about domestic tour and travel, how they're doing, and, and how they see recovery coming out of this. Um, what I love about this week as well, these are two solid motor coach companies. Um, so, so other conversations that we've had with FIT travel or wholesale travel, um, there are different challenges that both of these companies are facing when, when they're trying to figure out how they're going to roll again. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, Dennis Lyons is the Vice President for Coach and Tour Group at DATCO. Uh, Dennis, um, you've been in the industry a while uh, and with DACO, and we really appreciate you being here and sharing your insight with us. Thank you. Um, and we also have Julie Gagnon, who is the general manager for Jolly Tours. Um, Julie's facing a whole different kind of challenges. They're based, as, as everyone on the call knows, they're based in Canada, in Ontario. So we have some border crossing issues that, that Julie's facing that we can talk about today as well. Um, Julie, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for being on the call. Um, and uniquely um, for everyone on the call and, and all of our ABA members, you probably know that 
that Dadco's CEO is the chairman of ABA right now. Um, and Julie uh, runs the tour and travel um, committee for OMCA. So we have well, some really great knowledge and insight. I'm sorry, did I, I get it? I, I don't run it. I'm the vice chair. Well, there you go. So, so she's the vice chair. She'll run it next year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, without further ado, I want to turn it over to our panelists. And and if anyone on the call is not comfortable or does is not familiar with them, um, Dennis, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about Datco and some of the markets you generally focus on? Sure, thanks. Um, so Datco is a, a large, um, quite diversified bus operator based in Connecticut. Um, we operate a, a little over fourteen hundred vehicles in total. Uh, most of those are school buses. Um, we do operate 75 charter coaches um, and then about 100 other uh, commuter vehicles, transit vehicles. We do, um, you, we do everything from, you know, day trip charters and tours to uh, Connecticut transit, commuter and transit contracts, campus and corporate shuttle. Um, so a little, a little bit of everything, which, which in, in a normal year provides us a lot of opportunities, keeps us well balanced, keeps us busy year round. Um, most of that has, has come to a stop. Um, some of our transit contracts are still operating. Um, so we've got about 20 buses, uh, 20, 21 buses on the road daily right now. Um, but in, in normal times, um, you know, we're, we're a very busy operator with a, with a lot of different types of service that we manage day to day. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Julie, tell us a little bit about Jolly Tours. Well, we are uh, predominantly a leisure, leisure tour operator. We dabble a little bit with school groups, but we're not predominantly uh, school groups. We're mainly senior leisure, um, adult leisure. And um, much like Dennis, uh, even with our, our uh, charters that we run, is we're at a full stop, of course, as well. So we're all, we're all equal on that playing field right now. Everybody's at a full stop. I guess the $50 million question for all of us is how and when do we gear up? And what do we gear up with? I think the times are all brand new now, aren't they? They absolutely are. Yes, that's for sure. And, and you took the question, you know, right out of my mouth um, is, is what um, we clearly know what your challenges are. We know, we know what you're facing there, but as you're trying to figure out, out how you gear up, um, what, what does that look like for you? I mean, you both run tours, you both run leisure tours, you know, are, are you planning to have any run at the end of this year or are you just looking towards 2021? And Julie, I'll go ahead and start with you on that one. I think that to say we're planning, we've never stopped planning, but we're going to be driven by consumer confidence. And I don't know when we're gonna see the return of that. Um, consumer confidence is gonna be the, the, the crux of all of this. When do people feel comfortable to travel? How far do they feel comfortable to travel to? And that's, that's whether we have, um, you know, domestically, whether our borders are open or not, are people going to stay closer to home when they travel within their state or their province? These are all questions. I think if we, if we all had the answers to those, we would have been millionaires in this industry a long time ago if we could read the mind of the consumer. You know, one, day, one year you think you have it right and the next year you're schooled and you don't. So that's the $50 million question right now is what will consumer confidence at the, not at the end of this, when there's light at the end of the tunnel look like? Right. Um, and, and Dennis, would you would you share in that in that statement? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's far more unknowns than there are knowns. Um, I mean, we're doing as a business, we're doing okay, which I guess is the, the, the great, right? Um, we don't know. This this is the first one of these crises in the travel industry. We weathered a few of them in the 30 years I've been here. But if you look back to say 9/11, in the week that followed 9/11 because of our diversity, we immediately started doing other types of trips. We got, we got very involved in, in relocating groups that had been stranded because the airlines were down. Um, so, so you immediately had other stuff to do. Um, and some of the other things like a SARS, SARS, it was more regional. It impacted certain cities. The DC sniper impacted DC, but people would go to Boston, they would go to Philly. Um, this is the first one that, you know, in my experience that has shut the world down. Yeah. 
So it's international travel, it's domestic travel. Uh, to Julie's point, I, I think it'll come back, um, I think it'll come back slow um, as people kind of put their toe in the water, um, staying close to home, maybe smaller groups. Uh, I think as an industry, you know, the bus side, we've been talking lately with some peers and I think we have to change the conversation on social distancing and focus the conversation on keeping people safe because social distancing is, is, is the enemy of the bus industry. Um, so we got to keep them safe. We got to keep our, our buses clean, and we've we've um, we've found more ways of of keeping buses clean in the past seven weeks than we ever thought existed. Um, and and they're arguably cleaner than they've ever been. And we run a clean fleet, um, but that that's where our focus has to be is on on and how do we get the consumer confidence back, um, and and it have it be you know have that still exist when you're when you're putting four kids in a hotel room or you're putting fifty people into a motor coach. Um, we've got to do the things that, that give them the confidence to travel with us again. I mean, I think our camps will come back this summer, but they're going to come back. They're going to bring the kids to camp. They're going to bring them home, but we're not going to do any of the field trips while they're at camp. Um, so you're going to see pieces, you know, e even the pieces that come back will come back in pieces themselves. So it's, it's going to be a, a challenge to, to keep tabs on it all. Right. So, you know, it's, it's interesting as you started talking about social distancing and Lori, thank you for this question. Lori put up a question that I'm sure you guys can see right now. Um, we've heard a lot um, this week from JetBlue and some of the airways here domestically in the U.S. And Julie, I know we talked when we were preparing for this call about what Air Canada's doing, um, that they're kind of bypassing that six foot two meter rule um, with masks. Um, and as we were preparing for this call, we had a, a really solid conversation on what that looks like for motor coaches. Um, so what kind of conversation is happening right now um, at the, the regulatory level? Um, if you can share anything you might know on, on blocking seats or masks on coaches and, and kind of what that will look like moving forward. And then Lori's second question was clearly that affects pricing and fixed costs and you being able to run a bus. So how can the industry help you if that is the case to move motor coaches in the future? And Julie, do you want to go first? Well, I think it speaks to, again, you know, like Dennis said, there's so much unknown. I know that in discussions um, at the OMCA level, and I'm sure ABA is having the discussions as well, is as an industry, we would really like to set out our best practice, if that's the right word. Um, what do we think we can do to encourage the social distancing, whether it's installing shields on a motor coach or masks, but our best foot forward might be vetoed by the regulatory bodies. Maybe, you know, our ministers of transportation in Canada and the equivalent in, in the United States will say, no, this is what we say is going to happen. And it's hard, to, it's hard to make a plan. I guess you have to work a number of different angles and say, okay, we can go all these different directions depending on what the rules become. And then back to, well, our, again, like I, I gave you both the example the other day that I understand Quebec's policy right now, the province of Quebec is um, any motor coaches that are running in the Greyhound and such forth are 12 passengers on a coach. Well, not a tour operator or coach operator alike can operate with 12 people on a coach. That doesn't, that doesn't even cover the fuel. So it's, 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 it is a tough question and, and that's the thing, like everything else with this, there isn't a definitive answer. I think we have more time to put in until we have those answers. Understood. And, and Dennis, our... Yeah, so it's gonna vary by market. So our, we, we right now have our commuter buses um, cordoned off. So we're, we're probably down on a 55 passenger bus. We're probably down to that 12 to 14 seats per bus, um, which is fine right now because there's far fewer than that traveling on them. Um, when it comes back, I think it'll, it'll it again, it'll vary by market and by customer demand. Uh, we have contracts, the customer is gonna determine how many people they're gonna let in a bus. I don't think the airlines went around the six foot rule with masks with FAA's permission. They just went around it because that's what they're going to need to do. You, you know, like we can't afford to run a bus with 14 people on it. They can't afford to run a 737 with 50 people on it. 
Exactly. So you, you're going to have to take the steps, other steps to keep the passengers safe with cleaning and with, with PPE. Um, you know, I think the commuter business will come back slow anyways, because you, you've already got companies adjusting to work from home. Um, so they may let those folks work from home longer and come back to the office later than other segments of the population. Uh, maybe some of them won't come back. They'll just work from home will be the new norm for them. Um, so in that part of our business, seat segregation might be, uh, might be a solution. But to Julie's point, in charter and tour, it's just not an option. Um, you know, we've seen a move the past few years to smaller buses, the 36-passenger buses, the 24-passenger minibuses. But what are you going to put in those? Three people, four people? Um, I mean, the whole dynamic just doesn't work for, for group travel. I mean, all of the efficiencies of group travel go out the window if you enforce six-foot social distancing. And like we said the other day as well, if we all do not have the same baseline set of rules and it differs from one province or one state to the other, then that's a whole new problem. You know, if we're coming from Canada to cross the border in Upper New York State, our rule is this in Ontario and New York's is this, and, and they're not the same, then we, that's a whole new set of problems. Right, absolutely. Um, so, and, and Dennis, you mentioned, you know, other, other ways to make people feel comfortable. And you talked a little bit about, about new protocols and cleaning. You guys have always had clean coaches, but what, what are the new protocols? What else? I mean, I, I think we, we run events. We're looking at foggers. We're looking at, at all kinds of things, you know, that, that you can do to, to get something clean quickly um, and make people feel comfortable. What are you looking at? So we, we've elected to go electrostatic spraying, which is a kind of a form of fogging, but it, um, whatever chemical you're spraying to disinfect the coach gets electronically charged. And, and the science of it is that everything in the bus currently is negatively charged, so it just attaches to it. And the molecules that you're spraying all naturally oppose one another. So you get more even coverage. You get coverage on the back of handrails, on the bottom of surfaces, like and your seat belts, it'll go completely surround your seat belt. Um, so we think that's got the best overall coverage. Um, the application times are reasonable in, in terms of the, how quickly we can apply it to a bus, um, how fast we can then come back through the bus and wipe the surface down and get the bus back into service. Um, so we've, we've looked, at it, uh, looked at them all. We probably haven't looked at as much detail as I, as I typically would, because just because of the timing. Um, but we ended up choosing the electrostatic um, spraying or fog an option for our fleet. Okay, and Julie, are, are you guys looking at, at anything differently? On that particular question, I would have to defer to our motor coach company to know what they're what sure. they're involving and not involving. So I won't speak to it because it's not my knowledge. No, no worries on that. Um, and and a question came in from Tracy. You know, talking about. Um, waiting for regu you know, rules and regulatory, you know, we're working uh, with ABA and OMCA. What can um, all of our attendees here, you know, that, that live and breathe this tourism industry like we do, um, what can they do to help? Can they contact ABA? Can they be involved? You know, can they, you know, what, is there anything that, that either of you know from, from either association that, that we can do? I think, um... You know, we're an ABA member, obviously, with Donald as chair. Um, I mean, certainly get involved with your national organizations, be it ABA or United Motor Coach, National Tour Association, um, whoever, because I think the one voice is stronger in Washington. Um, but then individually, be, be writing to your representatives and your senators. Um, ABA and UMA have, have joined up to, um, we're going to have a rally in Washington on the 13th, um, Buses Move America. So that'll be a big side from, at least from the motor coach perspective. But I think that the travel industry has got to be doing the same thing through their different lobbying initiatives so to uh, make sure we have one very loud voice in, in Washington, D.C. And, and in Ottawa. I mean, it's a, it's a huge part of both nations' economies, supports a, um, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees and, and tens of billions of dollars in economic impact. So. Um, the fact that we haven't been heard yet is, is, uh, is dismaying and somewhat dumbfounding. Um, but we, we finally think we're starting to get some, some acknowledgement from at least in Washington. And, and I, would, I would also comment that 
Um, the U.S. Travel Association has been working very closely with the American Bus Association, with yeah. NTA, with OMCA. Um, they're all trying to share one voice. Um, so if you do want to get involved, I would I would suggest go to um, a, the ABA site, go to OMCA, or go to ustravel.org, and they have a great toolkit um, set up that you can that you can download and and utilize um, in your local area or region. Um, so let's switch to end of this year, 2021, what you're hearing from clients. Um, we talked about kind of, you know, the, the crystal ball of if people were going to stay closer to home, you know, kind of what, what their comfort level would be. Are you looking for different destinations? Are you creating different tours um, to kind of talk about that closer to home? And the second part of that is what are you hearing from your clients? Um, are you are you receiving any RFPs for this year? Or are they all you know out to 2021? And have you been successful to reschedule tours? That's the other part of that. Um, so Julie, let's start with you. Uh, we have been able to reschedule a couple of major programs for 2021, which I'm grateful for. Um, I guess what we have heard the most in a positive manner would be uh, they're really hoping that by the fall they can get out and do something um, or go and it's been very regional within our province or you know something as fun as going to the Quebec City Christmas markets or I'm not hearing as much about going na um, international or to the states but I think in everybody's mind the borders closed so they can't entertain the thought until it's open so I'm hoping when it's open that will that will spread some new thought outside of the province for sure. So yes, some very positives, also some very negatives. Uh, never going anywhere again, you know, emotions make a big play in, in times like these. But a lot of the, the folks that are really definitive, um, no, it's not for us, we're, we're gonna, this is, we're, are really the upper, upper age groups um, that, have that added risk of being susceptible to COVID and it's just too scary to even consider. Whereas folks kind of my generation are like, please open the planes. When can I go somewhere? I'm dying in this house. So I'm hoping there's enough of the me's um, to prompt some fall, late summer, fall travel if we have those abilities within allowable groups or allowable members, uh, number of people that can gather, I think is the words they're using. Got it. Dennis? Yeah, so from, uh, I'll speak to our tour company first and I'll, I'll be honest, we're, we're not the most, you know, dynamic thinking tour company. We're 85% we're student travel and a little bit of retail sports and theater. Um, so we're, we're pretty much, you know, Washington, New York, Boston, um, and I don't know that that's going to change dramatically going forward. Um, I think if, if folks do stay close to home um, and they do avoid the more crowded cities, then I, I think there's an opportunity there for, for some smaller destinations to, you know, this could be their time to get on the map and then, and then be known going forward and be in competition for trips. Um, we're seeing a couple of schools. Uh, we've, we've got two schools that, that both do pretty big tours with us, five or six buses. To DC um, that were canceled in March and April. Um, we've got them trying to go to their boards of eds and get permission to do those trips in the summer months to do them in August just before school starts back up. Um, you know as as things go on we'll see how that develops. So obviously you know your teachers wouldn't be there so you have to do different chaperones but um, they're talking about late summer or possibly doing them in the fall. Um, so we are seeing rescheduling opportunities on the on the with our larger tour operators that, you know, a lot of international travel we do in the fall, um, they had initially been moving to take folks off of spring cancellations, early summer cancellations and put them in fall departures. Um, we're, we're hearing that was not going the way they, they had hoped. Um, so they're likely to run fewer fall departures in their focus on moving the cancellations into 2021 now. Um, so, you know, I think it'll, it'll come back. I think it's going to come back slow. And like I say, the, the individual pieces are going to come back in pieces as well. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, we talked about moving things to the fall um, or into 2021 and, and Floyd, thank you for this question. Um, 
We've heard that from a lot of operators. We've heard, you know, moving programs or scheduling programs, airlines are providing vouchers, hotels are providing credits. Um, do you think that that could impact, you know, this, this large group of five buses that you have that might be moving into the fall? Are you gonna be able to find rooms? Have you had any, has there been any talk of that or has there been any challenge with that thus far? We've, we've um, based on the, the kind of loose dates they've given us as to when they travel, um, we've reached out to the vendors that, you know, were the original vendors on the package and they've all got currently have availability for the dates in both the, that they looked at in August and later in October. So as of right now, they have availability. Good to know. Um, and moving, um, you talked about moving some of those programs into the fall. I'm assuming that moving them into the fall, um, you're using your same product that you had before, or is it different from a spring summer product that you would offer that you're now moving into the fall? Do you need different types of activities or, or, you know, if you were outside before, how do you find something similar that, that weather may not be able to provide in the fall? Yeah, we're, I, I guess, uh, like I say, we're not, we're not maybe that creative or that dynamic, but we're, we're early enough that the secondary date in October is early enough that we'd still be able to do the, the okay. package that we were going to plan to do. And, and there might be, are you running into anything like that? Yes, there's some tweaking, um, you know, fall programs versus different seasons. There might be some tweaking. I think that um, some of this, again, is just the unknown, you know, credit vouchers with an airline. Well, I'm thinking that, I'm hoping that there's not going to be as much demand as there was in February or January. So to reschedule some of those won't be an issue. But I, unfortunately, it's just part of the gamble that we take in this industry. We really risk a lot in this industry to do what we do. Um, and no guarantees, but we'll have to make it work. Does that mean we, so, you know, there's losses all the way around the table here. So if we've reprotected a program and people are willing to go and that airline that we have a credit with can't honor it, well, our company would be looking to another airline and we're going to, it's going to be paying for it twice because you certainly can't be in a position where you're canceling clients that have agreed to rebook. So uh, lots in the air, lots keeping yeah. us all up at night, isn't there? Very true. Um, so we have, you know, we have some questions specifically um, on activities and, and, and Karen, thank you for this. Um, any of your theater clients, um, are they comfortable going back to the theater? I mean, we know that they haven't quite opened up yet or what they're going to do when they do open up. Um, but is anyone feeling uncomfortable doing the activities that they were doing before in the tours? Some will, yes. But um, a lot, especially that demographics, and we've had four theater show programs that we've canceled in the last six weeks alone. They're just so disappointed. They really wanted to see that show. So to me, it's kind of music to my ears because they're not focusing on the loss versus COVID. They're focusing on, well, what do you mean I don't get to go and see Wicked? I've been waiting for that for six months to come. So that's positive. That's very positive. Positive that, that you might be able to rebook. And obviously, exactly. you know, we talk about communication and, and messaging and making sure we're all saying the same thing, just like we did with, with regulatory um, when we talked about motor coaches earlier. Um, once you get the information from the theater, once exactly. you know what they're doing, you can communicate that out um, with, the, with the local DMO and, and, and have a combined message that I think would go a long way. Exactly. Um, and, and knowing that clients are, are, you're talking to them about being disappointed about not going and doing their tours, um, are they telling you, um, and this, this is a question from Clarissa, um, are, they, are they more comfortable traveling to certain regions other than, than others? And, and this has been a consistent question we've had in all of our webinars. Um, do you think people will want to go to smaller rural destinations or will they want to be outside versus inside? Do they want to skirt metro regions or are they good going to those larger destinations? Have they, have they mentioned anything like that or are you tracking that information? 
so far the stuff that we've rebooked has been um, has been charters. Um, a lot of a lot of the weddings we had booked for the next few weeks um, have we've moved to fall weddings. Um, so the destination is kind of you know what it is based on availability. We've not had anyone, I guess, um, reluctant to visit a large destination. But I, like I said earlier, I, I think there could be an opportunity here for some of the you know the the, the cities that aren't the big you know that aren't New York that aren't Boston um, to to get out there and, and get some business be, because people are a little wary of the crowds. You know, they they may not mind traveling together with a group that they know, but they may be a little reluctant to walk in Times Square. Yeah, for sure. I think um, outside of our motor coach leisure, leisure tour groups, I would say that the biggest kickback, and I think this is going to be a long time in coming back, is the cruise lines. You know, we do an awful lot of cruise groups, and um, our clientele are like, cruise ship? Oh, no, no, no. So um, I have hope that these smaller destinations and more regional gems, if you will, will be what shines for the next few months into next year. So, so knowing that, do you have all the information that you need in regards to those areas? You know, is it something that, um, are, you, are you welcoming information right now on some of those, those hidden gem destinations or living like a local, let's say, you know, some of the things that, that our participants can provide for you. Um, are you doing research and do you need information like that right now? I personally always say yes, because even what you think you know, you might not know, or there might be something new that you need to have your attention drawn to. Um, like many of the uh, people in our position, I've got decades worth of ABA conference binders and OMCA, but that information is only as good as that time frame. So yes, of course we welcome that because we don't want to miss it. Yeah. Something, something that's good. Perfect. Um, so after and, and Dennis, you mentioned 9/11 um, and and emotions and and kind of what goes into that and, and the emotional side of of choosing to travel. Um, after 9-11, we saw a lot of discounting, we saw enticements, we saw value adds, you know, people became very savvy travelers looking for the best deal. Are there things that you need right now that's going to help you do your job? You know, one of the questions was specifically with hotels, are they loosening up cancellation timing? Are they changing comp policies? You know, what, what can the industry do to support you to get people to book now? Um, you know, it, what, is, is there anything that works better for your companies than, than not? Uh, you know, from DACO's standpoint, we, we've never, uh, never been successful working to try and be, to, to try and be the low cost provider. Um, you know, we, we feel strongly that we offer a great value in transportation um, but, but the value is that, you know, it's at a reasonable cost, but it's a, it's a high end product. Um, so we don't typically even try and compete when it, when someone's looking strictly at trying to get a bargain, um, you know, in terms of vendors, you know, I, I think the hotel pricing is going to come with what the demand is. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've, we got some buses going to Washington DC for this rally in a couple of weeks and we're getting rooms, you know, in the DC area for $59 because the rooms are empty. You know, as it comes back, that's going to change. But that, I think that will be the only real value in it from our standpoint, because we, we won't we won't put a lot of effort into trying to be a, a less expensive option. We'll, we'll continue to run, uh, continue to operate the product we've always operated. It will run it as cost effectively as possible. I mean, one thing we have learned here is um, there's a lot of cost controls that we put in place here in the past seven weeks that will stay in place. Um, you know, money that we were spending that we didn't even realize we were spending, you know, GPS oh, yeah. turned off. Um, so I, I, I think there'll be some, some cost reduction there. Um, but it, I don't think it'll be our focus. We'll continue to look for, you know, we, we think we provide the best product for the best value. And, and we, that's what we look for in our vendors as well. We, we try and find the best product for our customer and we're, and we're willing to pay the extra for it. Got it. And Julie? I have to I have to say the same, Dennis, uh, as Dennis, you know, there's three of us in our company that are tour planners, uh, three and a half if you count the trainee right now. Um, 
and it's always been about the value of the product in its richness and its cultural value, not the price tag. And if that price tag is, um, if it has to be debased in order for it to be a deal, honestly, we've walked away from products because it doesn't fit the caliber of program we feel it needs to be. We don't discount, we don't offer flash sales. You know, I had a lady that worked for us a few years ago and one of the best pieces of advice she ever said or stated and it stuck with me is there's always somebody out there that is cheap let that never be us um and i believe it you know we stand by the integrity of our product as well it's it's very um it's not necessarily the most inexpensive out there but it's packed full of the right things and that's not changing because that's the core of our business that that honestly is a really great message um, and how does, you know, and that some of the questions that are coming in now um, tie into that is, you know, how do, what are your suggestions for suppliers to continue to promote their product and their destination at this time? And Tony, thank you for that question. Um, and with that, you guys are both talking about, about your programs and the content within your programs. Um, so I'll take it a step further. You know, how do the destin how do suppliers continue to promote with you? Um, and how do they take what you're selling and and the richness of your programs and promote that and help you promote that? Julie, do you have an idea? I guess knowledge is power. Giving us um, what's happening right now. Um, Back, the motor coach side is one thing, but the actual logistics of how different cities and regions are going to work in a post-COVID world, um, educating us on that is how we're going to know how to now sell Nashville or now sell Louisville um, and different destinations that we're dying to go to, but we're not sure on your rules. And um, these are two places that, that just come to mind right away because the local DMOs, the local attractions, they're always so gracious to us when we roll up. And that's what our people know. If you ask some of our folks about um, last November, I took um, a group to um, Pigeon Forge for Christmas in the Smokies. And we went to Gatlinburg for the day. And when all the people that work at um, Old Smokey's Moonshine, not just loaded up on our coach, but you know, literally put their arms around everyone, can't do that anymore, but said, come on in, you know, be part of the family. That's what they're talking about, not how beautifully Dollywood was, was decorated, although it was beautiful. So what are the niches and the really great gems that you have that we need to be using in the promotion of your destination and that's sellable and going going that extra mile having exactly. being creative in your attraction in your restaurant in your destination to exactly. what is that easy extra mile that that you can provide for the groups coming in dennis do you have any any thoughts on that no, I, I agree with everything that Julie said. I, I, I also think, you know, we get that, that, that big push of information right after we come out of ABA in the, yep. you know, in the winter and early spring. Um, I, I guess I would suggest that they, they maybe send stuff again because we, we took that, we sifted through it, we made our tour plan. Now we need a new tour plan. So to have the information fresh at hand, fresh in mind would be helpful. Um, but I agree with Julie, they got to let us know, you know, what are they doing? You know, what can we expect when we get there and what do we need to do to prepare our group for when we arrive? And uh, Lee, thank you for this question. He's asking how you're using DMOs differently than you may have in the past. Um, and I think Dennis, what you touched on is getting that updated information. And Julie, yeah. you touched on what are your cities doing? What are your regions doing? What are the rules now um, that certainly something that your DMOs can help you with, um, as well as, as contacts in the area. We, un, unfortunately, we hear it every day. There's, there's been furloughs, there's been layoffs, um, and your DMOs are, are key people to, to get contacts from on, on who's in the region and who's taking care of things. Um, 
And, and we talked about cleaning a lot. So another question from Lee was, um, are you requiring your suppliers that, that you work with to have these, these social distancing guidelines or, or standards that, that you're now holding your coaches to? We're, we're interested in what they're doing to, to clean their, their property, their attraction, whatnot, what they're doing to keep passengers safe. Again, we're, we're kind of backing off the social distance messaging because we think in the, in the longer term, that's going to be harmful to us. So I, I think as long as they can say, yeah, we can take your 50 people and give them a clean environment um, to, to sleep, to eat, to enjoy themselves, um, and here's how we'll do it, and we'll, we'll consider it. And certainly, to your point, keep us updated on contact information to the extent the DMOs know, you know, where changes have been made with the various, you know, their members. Keep the rest of that. It's true. I don't think we need to continue to beat the horse with the stick. We all know the social distancing. We all know the cleanliness factor. But when we come down to the brass tacks of what we do, we're talking about people's leisure dollars. They don't have to go on vacation. They choose to go on vacation and allocate dollars that way. We don't need that vacation to be a continual stressful event. We need it to be seamless behind the scenes and they just do the enjoying. I would say, you do the enjoying, I do the work. You know, um, you don't worry about it. That's my job. You just have fun. Um, and that's what that, that's what we have to do as an industry is we have to cover all the rules, but keep them having fun or they'll choose not to spend their leisure dollars with us. Right. It'll be Good too point. stressful. Good point. Um, so, and, and this is, you know, we, we talk at, and I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a tour operator in California, um, yesterday. Um, and, and the conversation really focused around travel insurance. Um, and how it's always been there. Um, but are you, um, do you see in 2021 or moving forward an increase in travel insurance? Do you see more people reaching out to grab that? You know, as you're talking with clients, are they asking about it? I, I think you'll definitely see people asking about it and taking it more. I mean, we just, um, we were fortunate just before this all happened to have a, I had to, had to attend a meeting in Hawaii um, so my family went with me and my wife was like, we're going to get the travel insurance. And I was like, well, you talk about we're not getting travel insurance. Why would you blow that money? And we didn't. Um, but now if she brought it up to me, I'd probably say, you know, yeah, we should probably get the travel insurance. So I think it will be an opportunity there. Right. This has been a big discussion on our side of the border with our tour operator council, OMCA, amongst us as colleagues. And, um, the current verdict is not really good, especially when our borders open, because our insurance companies up here in Canada have said, COVID is now a known risk. It's a, the house is already on fire. Don't ask us right. to pay for it. So there's no coverage, medical, trip interruption or cancellation for COVID, period. Now, that was also the case if you go back to 2012 when we had SARS. But once there was a vaccine, once it was no longer um, an issue, and of course, COVID's a much bigger issue than SARS was, uh, that dialed back. And we can expect our insurance companies to dial it back and say, oh, there hasn't been an outbreak in COVID in you know, nine years, and now it's insurable again. But when that becomes insurable is going to be really a big deal for us Canadian operators knowing when we can go back into the States. Because if people can't get insurance for this, they're not going to go. They're going to stay in Canada where they have insurance to cover them if there's a COVID outbreak. That's a big problem and it's a big hurdle for sure. That's an excellent point. Um... So some of our questions now are switching from, from the cleanliness and, and the insurance side of things to marketing um, and training. Um, Don, uh, thank you for this. Um, are, you, um, are your product development teams, your tour managers that you're talking about, are, are you available for webinar education? A lot, of the, a lot of attractions and DMOs, regions are partnering together to create virtual fam tours or virtual trainings? Is this something that, that your teams would be interested in? Yeah, sure. I mean, we've got, the, they're all working from home. 
um, and we've got their schedules as to when we expect them to be on, kind of structured on our, our phone coverage. Um, but with, with, you know, if a webinar is scheduled a couple days out minimum, then we could, we could adjust schedules so they can participate in the webinars. I'm sure they'd be happy to. For sure. Um, and we have uh, someone, and I'm super excited for this, Kurt, thank you, um, new to the motor coach industry and looking for to, to work more within it, um, like we all have for our trade shows that we've gone to, created profiles, created some sample itineraries, you know, what, what else can they do to, to get more involved in this crazy time when, when there's not as much contact anymore and they're new to the industry? I mean, I mean, Kurt's email or his question there says he's, he's near state parks, which probably offers the ability to, to do some distancing. So we I mean, certainly get the information out to us and, uh, and also kind of stress those things. Again, stress the, the cleaning procedures, stress the ability to spread out the things that he thinks are going to put his destination over in New York City or Philadelphia. Or Absolutely. And Kurt, welcome to the Motor Coach Tour and Travel Domestic Industry. It's awesome. They're great people like, like Julie and Dennis here. You're going to love working within it. Uh, Julie, do you have any suggestions on what else Kurt can do to get on the radar? Well, I was, it, I was actually thinking some of the really large tour operators that run series programs to the state parks like the Trafalgar's and the Globuses. I'd be reaching out to them too. You know, make sure they know who you are, what you do, and, and, and what's available to them as resources because everybody's, um, everybody needs to know or we don't know who to call. Right. Um, let's switch to marketing for just a minute. Um, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of research. You're, you're revamping some of your tours. You're looking at what's going on in 2021, um, regulatory issues, but what, you know, um, is there any marketing that's going out right now to your client base? Is it phone calls? You know, all of us, you know, we fill our days with webinars and, and phone calls to find out how everyone is doing. Um, are you doing any specific marketing to reach out to them right now? I'll, I'll start. I said, I, I tried early, earlier, well, maybe around the end of March, early April, and I was actually getting met with some pretty negative backlash. You know, not now, you know, how stupid are you people, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, okay, well, not opening up the door for more abuse, don't need that. So I've taken a wee bit of a different approach and that is to keep, and, and I see it happening on social media in droves lately, and it's all nostalgic based. Remember when, have you ever been to Barcelona? It's one of my favorite cities, here's some of my pictures. Um, so on our business Facebook site, I've been doing that. I've been creating these little nostalgic posts from previous trips, you know, and asking questions. When was your, what was your favorite destination? What was your favorite spot? And people are chiming in. I happen to have 15,000 photos on my phone. So I'm going back to that tour and finding a picture of them and posting it. Oh yes, we remember, you know, just trying to keep what we are as an industry alive in their brains. Don't forget about us because we, you know, we've been there to help you create some of the best memories of your life. So these are those memories live. And it's true of all of us. I think when you choose not to do something, it's okay. When you're told you can't, you want it even more, right? You, you know, right. so we're told we can't travel and all I want to do is get on a plane and go to Ireland. Um, and that's true of a lot of people. So I'm just trying to keep that in their heads. You know, you can't do it right now, but it's coming, it's coming. I don't I know think, if I, I would say- I think you ran into everything that, that we're all running into is how do you market and not, not be conceived as being tone deaf to what's going on in the mm -hmm. industry. and that. That's a great way to, to take that nostalgic spin and, and look back at, at what you have done. Um, last week, um, one of the requests from a couple of the operators were um, to, to also post about it, take your posts and forward on. You know, let, let social media live and, and have that be one of the marketing tools that we all get involved in with our clients is pushing the messaging that you're doing as well. Um, Dennis, have you been, have you tackled any marketing? We, we've done uh, 
certainly early on some social media around keeping the buses clean and, and being available for you know a group that needs to travel if there was a, a, a corporate move that had to take place that you know that we could do it we could do it safely um, beyond that we, we've done a lot of outreach by phone to our clients just kind of staying in touch um, as much about letting them know that we're here for them when they're when they're ready to come back as information gathering for ourselves to try, try and get a pulse on what's happening out there is there um, is there anything marketing wise that your partners or your suppliers could do? You know, obviously forwarding your posts, tagging tagging you in the posts. Um, anything that they can do um, to assist you in, in the march marketing stretch? I had an idea when I seen a post last night. We um, we spend one of our long term stays is in St. Pete's. Florida every winter and we got ours in this year just by the nick woo, just like that that's my backyard oh, we've been staying at the Alden Beach um, resort for better part of 30 years and the sales manager there the all excited May 4th are opening back up and she's trying to gear up you know some May bookings and she posted last night on her Facebook this rate for the month of May that's really to die for, but we can't travel and I can't take advantage of it. Or I would be calling our St. Pete's clients and saying, if you want to go to Alden just for a brain break, look at this great rate they're offering just to get back to normal. Right. That's really great. If those kind of promotions are, are existing, we can't, like I said, take advantage of that one. And as much as I would love her to extend it for the month of February, 2021, she said, no. Well, I think Rosemary Payne, um, who's the CVB there, is on this call. So I'm sure she's taking notes right now yeah. to see if she can make something happen for you. Um, uh, that Dennis, kind of thing. Anything, so, anything, I'm sorry, Julie, go ahead. If suppliers have those kind of incentives that they're running to kind of kickstart this industry again, tell us about them. Because those, you know, one thing I, I know with the consumer is it's really always about the pocketbook. And if the deal's too good to pass up, maybe that's all they need to feel the confidence to get out there again. I think we can try anything, right? And right. we do have an FIT side on top of our tour operations, which is where I could take advantage of that, um, even if I couldn't run a motor coach. But the, tell us what you're doing to try to kickstart your community so that we can hopefully get on the same bandwagon with you. Wonderful. And Dennis, do you have do you have any marketing ideas or thoughts? You know, obviously, social joint promotions, things like Julie's talking about. Yeah, I would say you know, you get the information to us. You know, we're we're trying to come up with you know what type of trip do we think you know will sell early on in the in the yeah. regions. Um, we actually have our first kind of ramp back, ramp up meeting with our marketing department next month to start talking about uh, next. I'm sorry, next week. To start talking about you know the things we're going to do and, and what are our ideas on some trips that um, we think will be the first to come back so to the extent that a destination um, has some thoughts on something they think will sell and sell early in the in the return process get that information out to us because um, those are the ideas that we're that we're looking for right now is what can we do early and then we'll focus on what we do longer term okay um so we are, and, and I, I told both Dennis and Julie that this hour would go so incredibly quickly and, and we're almost there. <clears throat> so generally around this time, I ask what keeps you up at night, but I think we talked about that at the beginning of the call. We know what keeps you up at night. So I'm gonna change that up a little bit and ask, knowing what you know now, what are you gonna do differently moving forward? <sighs> I know. I'll let you think for a while. Dennis, I'm going to put you on the spot. But I don't, I don't know. I, I still think long term. I, I just think that, you know, as a nation, even as a world, we're resilient. And in this industry, um, I think really exemplifies that, that you know, that, that they bounce back. So I, I, I think we'll come back. So, I mean, destinations may change. The way we do things may change a little bit. But I don't think, you know, if, if you fast forward 12 months, 18 months, um, that we that we are doing things dramatically different. I think um, you know, 
we get to a point where we've got vaccines out there, um, you know, to Julie's point, once, once COVID is not the, the, the latest, greatest threat, um, I think we'll, we'll continue to move ahead and, and we'll get back to a lot of things that we, that we were successful at and that we did in the past. We'll certainly do them differently. We'll, 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 you know, we've already decided, you know, the cleaning process that we put in place will not be COVID-19 cleaning process. They will just be in addition to our cleaning process. We always look for ways and we're, before this happened, we were always looking for ways to keep the buses cleaner. So we'll continue to do that stuff, but I don't, I don't see it being a, this cataclysmic change to this industry. I think this industry will, as it always has, it, it will just absorb it and rebound. Mm -hmm. It'll just, the difference will be, we'll be stronger. I think um, yesterday on, on a marketing webinar I was listening to, they called it um, not the new normal, but the next normal. You know, that, um, yeah. that you know, we're doing all of these things. We're going to continue to do these things. We're going to continue to clean. Um, uh, certainly social distancing is going to be in our mind for a while. Um, and, and especially, Dennis, you working with students, you know, four to a room versus two to a room and how that looks in the future. You guys are addressing that with ABA and LNCA. Um, but it is, it is going to be our, our next normal, not necessarily yeah. the yep. new normal. Um, and how That's we can a good term. Um, so I was just seeing the webinar chat, and I hear I see a comment down there. It says, yay, Grace at Alden. Yes, Grace at Alden. <laughs> how we love Grace. <laughs> well um, done, Grace. Well done, uh, Grace. Um, the... <sighs> You know, this industry, especially on the tour operator side and the motor coach side, we're predominantly a bunch of really tough entrepreneurs. I think we'll roll with this as we already have been, just like everybody else. But to Dennis's point earlier, it's definitely been a really good eye opener on where we have to tighten the belts and batten the hatches a little better. You know, we've all yeah. taken a really hard look at what the last six weeks have looked like and when we did what. Um, so that's going to be a big long term change, I think, for a lot of us. And just like everything, I think we're going to look back on this in a couple of years and go, we're right back to where we, we should be. Might different sections and sectors might be longer, like the cruise lines, but we're going to get back there. It's just a matter of when, not Absolutely. not how. Or it is how. So we'll, it's well, not, I'll it's ask when. one more question, um, a fun question. Um, we work in the tour industry. Um, you plan travel for a living. Where where do you want to go when all this is over, Julie? What do you want to do? Just, what do you want to see? I just said, I'm going on my own personal pub crawl around <laughs> Ireland for three weeks. <laughs> That's, That's a good one. That's a I, good one. I've already told my husband I have my bag in the spare bedroom pack ready to go. It made me feel better last weekend just to pack it. <laughs> and um, he doesn't have to come. He can if he wants. It's optional because I'm going. That's That's where I'm going. Awesome. And, and Dennis, uh, Dennis's uh, daughter is looking at colleges. So I'll just throw out there that you can't say you're going to look at colleges with your daughter because you're already doing that. I know you're upset about that, but where do you want to go? So it's cliche, but I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> I was supposed to be at Disney last week for one of their leadership conferences. So I'll, I'll reschedule that. I did the Irish pub crawl two years ago, the Scottish pub crawl last year. Um, so I'll go to I did them both last year too, but I need to repeat. <laughs> yeah, I get yeah. touche. Nice. Um, well, we, it is clearly almost two o'clock, so I promised an hour to to our panelists. Um, thank you so much for for being with us today and your insight. Absolutely invaluable. Um, and and I think we got um, through almost all of our questions. Um, really good information. Um, we will have a recording of, of this uh, particular webinar out uh, by this afternoon to everyone. Um, share it with your partners and anyone that couldn't tune in today. Um, certainly, uh, Dennis and Julie have both said I can share their information. Um, and, if, and if you have questions, um, they'll be happy to answer them. Um, and they want your information. We, we're going to get through this together. We're Tourism Strong. Um, we'll be back next week with another webinar um, focusing on Mexico and Canada. Uh, so please stay in touch with us, stay in touch with Julie, stay in touch with Dennis. 
um, so we can move forward together. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Have a Thank great you. day. Bye. Bye-bye.